take your Bibles and turn to that text that was just read for us, Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. This great uh, book that we have been walking through this fall. And, and I must warn you, I, you know, I, so, sometimes I think, you know, lots of things have warning labels. I think this sermon should have a warning label. This text is so amazing, and I'm worried I'm going to just talk so fast because I'm so excited about it. I'm going to move around and walk 100 miles up here, and I'm going to get so excited, and it's also that we're not getting out till noon, okay, because it's going to take that long to explain the thing. This is one of the most amazing texts of Scripture. And yet at the same time, I think it is a difficult text for us to live out of in real time for most Christians. I think the text is so amazing what it says about us because of what God has done. It's really hard for us to get our heads and hearts around these realities. So I'm hopeful by the Spirit of God that as we take a look into this text, you'll have a little bit better understanding of what this text is saying about you for those who know Christ is your Savior. I'm going to go back up to those first three verses we looked at last week that tell us the negative news. This is who we once were. This is the condition of every human being. This was the condition we were in before God brought us to himself. And Paul says this in verse 1 of chapter 2. You were dead in, your tres in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind." This is who we once were before God brought us to himself. And Ephesians 2, 4 through 10 is describing uh, and answering really three questions. Number one, he's answering the question, how did we or how did God get us from Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 into this new position of Ephesians 2, 4 through 10? How did God do it? The second question is, um, what, what identity or what new identity did God give us in his rescue attempt of moving us out of Ephesians 2, through, 1 through 3 to Ephesians 2, 4 through 10? And then why? Third question, why did God primarily do this in this manner? So let's look at these three questions. Let's try to answer them. The first question is, how did God rescue us from Ephesians 2, 1 through 3? Well, how did he do it? He did it by grace. How did he do it? He did it. How did he do it? It was all his action and had nothing to do with what we did. Look at verse 4. He's talking about the, in verse 1 through 3, the bad situation that we're in. We were dead. We were trapped by the world, the flesh, the evil one. We were children of wrath. And then in verse 4, but God. The way we got out of this mess in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 was what God did. Not what we do, what he did. He says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, and in the first phrase of verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses. What you need to understand about how you got out of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, is that it was God who did this because of his mercy, because of his grace, and he did this, taking you out of this terrible condition you were in. He did it even when you were still dead in your trespasses. And you think about that. God didn't sit up here in heaven and say, listen, if you get your act together a little bit better, I'll then rescue you. He didn't say to them, hey, if you can clean up your life a little bit, then I will rescue you. He rescues us even when we were still dead in our trespasses. And this is what makes Christianity and what makes Jesus unique among all of the other religious teaching you'll find in the world. 
Typically, religion says you better start doing these five things or more, and you need to stop doing these other things. And if you do enough good, and if you remove enough bad from your life, then God will accept you. Then God will love you. Then God will bless you. Christianity says the opposite. Christianity says there was nothing you could do by yourself to get out of Ephesians 2. You were dead. You were under the wrath of God. You were trapped by the world, the flesh, and Satan. I, God says, I had to do everything for you, and I started to rescue you even when you were still dead in your sins and trespasses. Now, that's incredible. I mean, that's amazing. He looked at you, saw the mess that you were, saw the... the, 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 the you being under the control of sin and, and being dead. And God, in his grace and mercy, because of his love, he says, I will rescue you and you don't have to change. I'm going to do it for you. Unbelievable. Paul goes on to describe this grace. It's his action, his grace is how we got rescued out of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And he describes it in verses 8 and 9 in this text. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. What Paul is saying is the way you get out of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 and into this new position of being rescued, it's by grace. It's a, grace means a gift. It's an unobligated gift that God pours out on us, not because we deserved it, not because we, we, we earned it, not because we worked for it. It's simply his gracious and gift given to undeserving people like ourselves. It's a gift. It's grace. He goes on in verse 8. He says, and this not your own, is not your own doing. Well, of course not. There was no way to get yourself out of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And when God says, it's by grace I've done it. In fact, I started to rescue you even when you were still dead in your trespasses. God is saying, it has nothing to do with yourself. You did not rescue yourself. Forget about this idea that you did anything to get you into a different position before God. Now, I, I don't know how to say this. I said, I'm going to say this lovingly. I'm saying it about myself. Sometimes I think as believers in Jesus Christ, we don't revel in that grace and we desperately want somehow to say we contributed to our salvation in some way. We're nuts. But to be fair, everything else in life, it, 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 there's not much grace out there in the world, all right? I mean, if you want to play soccer for your high school soccer team, you have to be better than, a, than most everybody else in your school except maybe 13 or 14 other players to make the team. You have to perform your way to get on the team. If you want to play in the, in the, in, in the New York Philharmonic as a, as a trumpet player, which I would have liked to have done that. You've got to play well. You can't botch every seven notes. You have to perform and earn your spot in that orchestra. When you're at work, typically, if you're going to be promoted, you have to perform. You have to execute. You have to make something happen. But not so with God. In order to get out of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, it, 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 there was nothing you could do to do that. It wasn't anything that you did. It was everything that God did by his grace. This is not your own doing. He goes on in the middle of verse 8. It is the gift of God. It's a gift. He gives you something that you didn't work for. He gives you something you don't deserve. And I know some of you celebrate birthdays. I've, I don't like to celebrate birthdays anymore. It's a, it's a bad memory. But when I was young, I liked birthdays. And people would bring gifts. And I like to invite a lot of people to the birthday because more gifts. But when people give you a gift at your birthday, you don't say, hey, now, you know, you know after the birthday party, hey, how much was that again? You know, write them a check. No, it's a gift, freely given. God doesn't work in a transactional way. He doesn't say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rescue from Ephesians 2, but you, know, you, got, you better straighten up your life. No, it's a gift. He gives us something we don't work for, we don't earn. And he goes on in 
verse 9, he says, not a result of works so that no one may boast. The way that God gets us out of Ephesians 2 and puts us into this new place, rescuing us from where we were trapped, rescuing us from the wrath of God, it's all his doing. Verse 4 says, but God, through his love, he does this when you were still in your trespasses. He doesn't wait for you to clean it, your, yourself up. It was nothing that you did. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. It's a gift of God so that you don't boast. And even your faith, go back up to verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And there's a lot of lexical discussion about does, does the gift here, it is the gift of God, refer back to the faith. It almost doesn't matter how you come down on that issue. The whole thing is grace. Even your faith is part of grace. Nobody trusts Christ on their own doing. The issue for you is, it, when, before you came to Christ, is, oh, if you could just muster up enough faith. You didn't have enough knowledge of your sin. You didn't have enough knowledge of what God did for you in Christ to even know what to believe. By the Holy Spirit, he had to open your heart up so you could even see this. So your faith is part of the gracious gift of the whole gracious gift of your entire salvation. And one more thing about faith. Faith is not an action, so to speak. <laughs> faith is focused not on what you do. Oh, I'm going to muster enough faith and then God will accept me. No, faith is not about you. It's believing in the object of your faith. It's believing what did God do on your behalf. So faith is not something we should boast in. All of our salvation is a gift of God's grace. And that needs to move us probably far more than it does at times. This is something that, that, that should drive us. This is something that should, should, should bring us to our knees. This is something that where we, we fall down and we say, you know, as, as we just heard the choir sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. This is what God did for us. And it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with him. How did you get out of Ephesians 2? It was God's grace from beginning to end with nothing that you brought to the table to bring you out of the mess you were in in Ephesians 2. Well, that's the first question, first answer. The second question is question is what new identity did God give to us as he rescued us this is vitally important what was the new identity because it wasn't simply that he rescued us he gave us a completely new identity you see our old identity before we trusted Christ was that we were dead we were objects of his wrath we were under the control of, 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 of the world, the flesh, and, and, and the devil. But now, we have a completely new identity. Look back at verse 5. It says, even when we were dead in our trespasses. And then look at this three-part identity. We're going to look at two aspects of identity. This is the first aspect that has three parts. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him. And he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice this three-part ide identity. We once were dead, now we're alive. We once were trapped by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now we have been resurrected with Jesus Christ. What Paul is describing here, as he describes in many other places, is what happens to Jesus, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, happens to you. He died to sin once for all. You died to the guilt and power of sin once for all. And ultimately, you'll be free from the very presence of sin in the next life. Jesus raised from the dead. You've been raised from the dead. You now have new power to live free from the de facto power of the world, the flesh, and the evil one. And now you're also seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God, on the throne of God, ruling and reigning the universe. And you are right there with him spiritually. Now, 
I, I don't know. This is where you need, you need supernatural help to understand this. This is not just little positive thinking words. This isn't just some self-help seminar. Here, feel good about yourself. You're alive now. You've, you've, you, you raised with Jesus. You're, you're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Feel good about yourself. I'm saying this because this is what God says about you and me and all of us who've trusted Christ. This is not just some slogans. This is the reality of who you now are. I just remember my favorite professor at Howard Enrich says, too many Christians are not excited by the truth. We're embalmed by the truth. This should form the way you view yourself. Not because it's you that did this. It's God who did this. And because God did this, and this is what God says is true about you, we ought to believe it and live in it and rejoice in it and make every, every effort to let this atmosphere of this new life, resurrected power, seated at the right hand of God, in the heavenly places with Christ, ought to be the way you view yourself fundamentally. In a very real sense... This is the new identity that we have been given by the grace of God. It is true of us. And th this is so important. This I identity had nothing to do with your performance before you came to Christ. But your performance as a believer cannot undo your true identity, no matter how bad you had, no matter how bad you performed last week. Because it's not based on your performance. When you get sidetracked and you, uh, you know, we sing this song, you know, Lord, you know, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. When you find yourself uh, listening to the world and the flesh and Satan, not because they have power over you, but because you kept, got your eyes off of Jesus and these things have tempted you in a different path, even though you may be straying from what you ought to be doing, it doesn't change the fact that you're alive. You've been raised with Christ and you're seated in the heavenly places. Just because you live inconsistently with your new identity doesn't mean that your new identity somehow goes away and doesn't mean that the only way to get your new identity back is you've got to perform yourself back into it so God will re-give it to you. No, that's not how it works. This is who you are quite apart from your performance. I think this is one of the tragedies for believers. You get off track. You listen to the world. Even though it doesn't have power over you, you let it have power over you in a moment. And all of a sudden you've strayed and all of a sudden you've sinned and all of a sudden you've fallen into some things you know are wrong. And all of a sudden you lose sight of who you are because we are all prone to define ourselves by our performance. It's the Princeton way. You don't get into Princeton University unless you have a pretty nice portfolio. So let me help us a little bit to understand how living in light of this new identity can help us in our struggle against sin and in our walk with Christ. I'm going to take the world, the flesh, and the devil. These were the things that did control us. Because of Christ, we're now alive. We've been resurrected uh, in Christ. We are now seated with Christ in the heavenly places. The world, the flesh, and Satan do not have de facto power over us anymore. We sometimes listen to those powers, but not because we're controlled by them. We allow ourselves to go back under them, but we are actually free because we're alive and we've been resurrected. So let me take each of these... Uh, the world of flesh and devil, some of the temptations they might throw out and just help us to see how rooting our identity functionally and who we are in Christ can help us. Satan, when you read the, the scriptures, uh, Satan is uh, called the accuser of the brethren. Um, I don't know, some of you might think, oh, Satan, what, what do you guys, you guys believe in Satan? Listen, I think Satan's a pretty good ex explanation for why the world is as messed up. The fact that there's a personal, powerful source of evil in the world, I think gives a lot more explanation for why the world is the way it is. But one of the things that Satan will often do to us 
We'll look, about, we'll look at this in Ephesians 6 in a couple of months as we round out the book. He sends what Paul calls a fiery dart. It's a lie. It's a half-truth. And he's called the accuser of the brethren because he, I think what he does, at least one of his strategies, is to try to get you to believe that because your performance isn't consistent with your new identity, that your new identity is not really true about you. He sends you a little half-truth. How could you do that? You think you're a child of God and you said that? You, you, you really think God really loves you and cares for you and is forgiving your sins after you did that or you didn't do what you were supposed to do? This is a, a common satanic attack. And what has to happen for us, if we're going to stand up under that attack, even when we fail, even when we live inconsistent with this new identity that God has given us, we have to keep coming back to the fact that while I may have acted inconsistent with my new identity, the new identity I have in Christ, being alive, resurrected, and ascended with Christ, is still true even when I don't live up and live consistently with that new identity. Let's take the flesh. If you look at the flesh in Galatians 5, the, uh, the expressions of the flesh, a lot of the flesh has to do with us comparing ourselves to other people. It talks about rivalries and dissensions and, and being jealous of other people. Part of what our flesh is trying to tell us a lot of the times is we don't measure up, not necessarily before God, but before other people. Now, if you're a parent, you know what this is like. How many of you ever, and some of you parents may be facing that this morning. Don't worry. I, I'm not judging you, and these folks shouldn't be judging you either. But how often have you had your children in a public place, and your child melted down in a very bad way? In church. And you can feel people looking at you. And you can almost feel people, and I'm not sure they're thinking this, but you almost feel that. Ah, the Troxels, boy. Look at those kids. That's some bad parenting there. Those kids are out of control. Those kids are on their way, you know, to, who knows, you know, it's, it's bad. You, you feel that. And you compare yourself. And you begin to wonder, why doesn't God bless us the way he blesses other families with children who seem to behave and seem to love church at the age of two? And that's okay. I love you. I'm glad you're here. We compare ourselves in our flesh to the, everything around us. We begin to wonder, why is God blessing this person and not me? Why do bad things happen to me? And we get all confused because we've lost sight of what God has done for us. We're alive because of Jesus Christ. We've been raised to life through Jesus Christ. We are ascended in the heavenly places with Christ. That is our identity. And when we look at anybody else to compare ourselves, we're getting our eyes off of what God has done for us. We're forgetting who we are. Which is a recipe for moving further afield in our actions away from who we actually are. One last thing, the world. The world is, does a lot of different things. I'll just give you one. One of the things I'm deeply concerned about for us is because we live in a culture where political identity is massive. It wasn't always the case in the United States. 30 years ago, there, there was a survey done, um, and I, I attribute this to, to David Brooks, who, who shared these. I've heard him say this several times. 30 years ago, they did a survey. And the survey went like this. If your child married into a family that had very different political views than you, would you be upset? 5%, five out of 100 people said, I would be upset. 30 years later, today, that number is north of 40%. And so you can see the polarization that takes place in our culture. Now, it's one thing if that's happening out here. My big concern is it's going to crash into us. Where now we're going to be upset with one another if we don't vote the same way or we don't think things the same way or we don't see things the same way because our political identity functionally becomes more important than the identity we have in Jesus Christ. And then when they, if that happens, and I'm fearful that it is going to happen with some of us, shame on us. 
Jesus Christ is very clear in Ephesians, in this text. Our main identity should be focused on what God has done for us. We're alive, we're resurrected, we're ascended, we're new people because of Christ. That should be the identity we live out of. And every other worldly identity, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, religious background status, and political identity should pale into insignificance than the identity we share because we are in Christ. One more thing I will say. I have a bunch of neighbors that are totally freaked out by this election. Okay? And they're outside the church. But they really believe if one of the candidates wins, the, the country will be thrown into complete anarchy. It'll be a disaster. I know other people, some even at this church, who thinks the exact opposite will happen if the other candidate is elected. Now, I don't know what will happen. I don't know. I, frankly, I'm concerned about the other election taking place. <laughs> I'm kidding. Being the self-absorbed person that I am. But think about this, believers, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Even if the worst thing happens and a candidate and the country is thrown into chaos one way or the other. I mean, even if the worst scenarios happen, I mean, that would be grievous. We should pray. That won't be pleasant. But it doesn't change your identity. You are alive to God. You were once dead. You couldn't even relate to God. You couldn't even know who God is. Now you're alive. You were under the control of the world, the flesh, and Satan. But now you have the resurrection power of Christ. Christ raised from the dead. You're raised from the dead. You have the power to defeat the world, the flesh, and the evil one. And you also have enough power, the same power that Jesus has and he rules the world. You have that same power is available to you. Why? Because you're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And therefore, even if the whole thing is as bad as you think it's going to be. I'm not saying so what? That would be bad. But does that change what God has called you to do? Does that change your fundamental identity? Does that change the fact that you have gospel responsibilities to yourself, to one another here in this church, and to the world, and we can fulfill them? No matter what's going on out there. My brothers and sisters in Christ. We have to live. In the security. And the power. Of the new identity. That we've been given by God. Through Christ. And I think some of us. We need to learn from our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Who live all around the world. I remember a good friend of mine, I was living overseas, I had a good friend of mine come into a meeting. We were working on charitable projects in country. He came to me with a big smile on his face. He's from the Ivory Coast. And he said to me, my country is greater than the United States. And I was like, oh, really? Okay. He said, you have one president. We just had elections last week. We have two presidents. And I ask him point blank, are you worried for your country? He says, am I worried? Well, yes. But then he went on to say, I believe the church of Jesus Christ has a great opportunity in the midst of the chaos of my country to see the gospel go forth as it never has before. Why did my friend say that? Because his political identity was not wrapped up in, in the political situation of his country. His identity was wrapped up in Christ. say this one more time just to get it through our thick heads here and my thick head hundreds of thousands of believers live all over the world in places that are far worse politically than what we have now even if the worst thing happens in this country so many believers live in countries right now where they have no choice on who their leader is. They've got a king for crying out loud. They've got a dictator. And in some of these places, the government is hostile in actual policy toward them, toward believers. In many places, hundreds of thousands of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ risk their lives to go to church. Church. 
risk their jobs if they are caught sharing the gospel with other people. Imprisonment, interrogations, or worse. And what keeps them going? Not their political identity. That's worthless. What keeps them going is I think they have a better handle than maybe we do. That their identity comes from the fact that they are alive, that they have been resurrected with Christ, they are in the, in the heavenly places with Christ. That's their identity, and they carry on no matter what's happening around them. That's who we need to be like. That's what we need to do. So that's the second question. I've got one question just real quickly. The third question, why did God do all this? Now, I know he did it for us. Of course he did. But I want you to see that, 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 that one of the main reasons God has done this great act has nothing to do with you, per se, and me, has everything to do with the vindication of God's glory. Let's go back up to verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And here's the phrase, verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. <laughs> in other words, what you see here, yes, God wanted to save us and rescue us from Ephesians 2. He's done that. But one of the main reasons why God do does this is to vindicate the glory of himself. It's even not about us, even in the rescue attempt. It's not fully about us. It's about him. He wanted in the coming ages, he wanted to demonstrate that word show means demonstrate the immeasurable riches of his grace. He wanted to show the universe the glory of his character by rescuing people like us who are trapped in Ephesians 2. By grace, he takes us out. He gives us this new identity. He wants to show the universe, this is who I am. And he pours out his grace like this. I think too often we make even our own rescue by grace, we're tempted to somehow think we did something that made that happen, but we didn't. It's by grace, not us. Even when we have this new identity of, of, of being, uh, <coughs> be, be, being you know, raised and, and alive and, and seated with Christ in the heavenly places, we're tending to put some other identity to make it about us. And then even in the future, we make what God did for us all about us. And yes, he did that for us. I don't mean to say he didn't. But a lot of what he did was to vindicate the beauty and glory of who he was. One last thing. As we close, verse 10. He says, for we are God, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's interesting, he says we are his workmanship. It's another piece of our identity. We are the artistic expression of this loving God who is in the process of helping us to live more consistently with who we already are. That's what it means we are his workmanship. He's fashioning us. We were created in Christ Jesus. We already are this new creation, but he begins to fashion us so that in real time, we act more consistently with the person we already are by grace. And then, of course, here's the kicker, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. <laughs> you can't even do a good thing and take credit for it, even as a believer. Because, because it was, it was, it's God that prepared the, beforehand that you would do that. That you should walk in them. And again, it's all about God. It's not about us. It's all about what he's doing in our lives. It's about him, not us. It's about his grace, not our effort. It's about his new identity he's given us, not the new identities we try to, to, to manufacture from the world, the flesh, and the evil one. And one thing I would encourage you as we close... Since God is the one who prepares these good works for you to do, not to earn your salvation, you've already been given it, you already have this new identity, you've already been rescued from Ephesians 2, is that when you see God begin to change you, even in a little way, celebrate that. 
as the work of God in your life. I have a friend of mine who work, runs a faith-based recovery group for uh, alcoholics and drug addicts. He was doing a Bible study for new believers. He had about, I think, eight guys who had come to Christ in the last month. So he's doing this Bible study. They're working on sobriety. They're doing some basic follow-up after these guys trusted Christ. And one of the guys who had been a Christian for 14 days, his was his testimony at the, at the, at the, at the, at the the Bible study. He goes, guys, for the last 10 years, I've been high every single day or drunk every single day for the last 10 years. I want to give praise to God because I was actually sober six of the last 14 days. Now, I wonder, for some of you, if you had been in that group, what would you have said? Oh, what happened to the other eight days, pal? Well, thankfully, the group looked at him and said, praise God. Praise God, you've been sober six days that you haven't been in 10 years. Praise God, this is God's good work in your life. Can you imagine that? Praising God that a guy was drunk and high for eight days? They praise God for the six. Why? That's God preparing good works for that person to do. And I just encourage you in your family, in your small group, when you see a believer, when you see yourself, Making a little bit of progress, as, as, as small as it may seem, that is God's workmanship working in your life to do the things that he's already prepared for you to do. Rejoice. God is at work. Let's take a moment and pray. And then we're going to finish our service by worshiping God for this great grace. So let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you that he rescued us, Lord, by grace. Lord, you did it all. We did nothing. It was all your grace. You, you, you began to save us we, even when we were still dead in our trespasses. You poured out your grace. It wasn't anything we've done. The whole part of your salvation was all of grace. It was your gift. Lord, could we rejoice in that? Could we revel in that? Could we see that more clearly? Lord, I also pray that you would help us to see that you not simply rescued us, you did that, but you gave us a completely new identity through Christ. An identity that should form the way we view ourselves because of what you've done. Because of what you say is true about us. Help us to believe that, to live in it. Help us to realize the why of why you did this. You saved us in part to vindicate the glory of your name. It was all about you from beginning to end. And Lord, I pray that as you begin to do the good works that you prepared us to do, because you are trying to help us become more consistent with who we already are, that every little piece of progress that we make and the others around us make, could we praise God for those efforts, as feeble as we may think they are, as incomplete as they probably are, to thank God from beginning to end because our salvation is all about you and has really nothing to do with us in any way. Help us to see that. Help us to revel in that. Help us to rejoice in that and to live out of that gracious, loving, new identity that you've given to us through Christ. Pray this in your name. Amen. I want us to stand together. We're going to close out our service. We're going to sing, A Yet Not I, But Through Christ. Uh, we'll also be singing, Be Thou My Vision. And then our benediction will be the singing of the doxology. So let's stand and let's praise God for his grace.